evening, everyone, and welcome to another evening of Northshire Presents. I'm so happy to see you all here with us tonight. For those of you who don't know me, I am Rachel Person. I am the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York. Here, as I so often am these days, with my good friend and colleague, Gabith Wood, event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Manchester, Vermont. Um, a couple of quick notes before we get started. First of all, as you're coming in, you probably noticed that we are recording this evening's presentation. However, fear not, we have the settings arranged so that only those of us who are unmuted and speaking will be recorded. Um, so you will not be recorded for posterity in this recording. Um, in light of that, please use the chat function this evening for any questions that you have. You can pose questions at any time throughout the event and Davith and I will save those up and we will pose them for you at the end of the night. Um, and then last of all, before I turn things over to Davith to introduce our guest this evening, a note of thanks. Um, independent bookselling is a, a weird and crazy and tough business, even in good times. And I think that we can all agree that the last stretch have not been particularly good times. Um, and all of us at both North Shires are very conscious of the fact that we wouldn't still be here without the incredible loyalty and support of our customers like you. Um, we are deeply, deeply grateful for that support. And we thank you for being here tonight and for continuing to shop local. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to David to introduce our guest tonight. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I have been so looking forward to this event uh, for the last several months as it's been um, scheduled. It is my great pleasure to welcome author, illustrator, and king of the birders, David Allen Sibley. Sibley merged his encyclopedic knowledge of birds with his skills as an artist to become one of America's best known field guide authors. With the Sibley Field Guide to Birds, a New York Times bestseller, he was immediately hailed as heir to the great birder and artist Roger Torrey Peterson, placing him in the long line of artist naturalist hybrids that lead straight back to John James Audubon himself. His book, What It's Like to Be a Bird, is a New York Times bestseller and customer favorite at Northshire. NPR said that the book's beauty mirrors the beauty of birds it describes so marvelously. And a recent Boston Globe profile called him one of the best ornithologists that's ever been and the pandemic's most unlikely celebrity. I'll be handing things over to David shortly for his presentation, but after that, North Shire's adult book buyer, the amazing Stan Hines, will lead a conversation with David about birding and books and brown-footed boobies and other things um, before we get to the audience Q&A. So um, please join me in welcoming to North Shire Bookstore, David Sibley. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. That's great to be here. And um, uh, thanks to Northshire for uh, arranging this tonight. And thanks to all of you for, um, for being here, coming out tonight and, and supporting your local independent bookstore like Northshire. Um, it's, um, uh, I think this event was first talked about more than a year ago. <laughs> and pandemic interfered and we're finally here. So it's really great to be uh, be doing this. Um, and uh, hopefully someday soon we'll be able to do things like this in person and, um, uh, but happy to be here on Zoom tonight. Um, so I have a, a slideshow um, using some illustrations from my newest book, What It's Like to Be a Bird. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about just some of the amazing things about birds in winter um, as we head into a winter season here in the north. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and start talking about that. Um, so you should be seeing a, a blue jay on the screen now. Um, and this, of course, blue jay is one of the most familiar birds of the northeast. It's a, a very frequent visitor to bird feeders. This one in this painting is gathering an acorn and flying off with the acorn. Blue jays are one species that um, stores a lot of food. They, they spend a lot of the summer and fall gathering food like acorns and stashing it in secret hiding places where they'll come back and find it during the winter. Um, but the... Uh, Um, winter season is uh, difficult for birds, the, uh, and there's only a few species that um, stick around. The, the 
number of species of birds in New England, Northern New York. Um, in the summer, there might be a hundred species in a within a small area nesting, living their lives. In the winter, that number goes down to just a couple dozen. Um, the species that have adapted to handle the winter in the far north are um, um, some of the most specialized and uh, really remarkable. These morning doves in this painting shown with a dusting of snow on their back, they're so well insulated that snow can actually collect on their feathers, even though the body just an in, less than an inch away underneath those feathers, their body might be 104 degrees. That's a pretty average body temperature for birds. So, um, Birds are the direct descendants of dinosaurs. I'll start with that. Uh, um, a lot of dinosaurs had feathers and birds, the first birds appeared around the same time as this dinosaur, Anchiornis. So the first um, true bird, Archaeopteryx, appeared about 160 million years ago, about the same time that this, the, this dinosaur was from. And these, the feathers that this, that Anchiornis had and Archaeopteryx were more um, sort of loose shaggy feathers like a modern ostrich plume. Um, later, uh, more modern birds um, evolved feathers with barbules that, that stick the barbs together to hold the feather in a more solid flat plane. And that's what that adaptation really led to um, uh, making flight possible. Um, but this dinosaur, Anchiornis, had lots of feathers um, about 160 million years ago. Um, and when the, there was a giant asteroid that struck the Earth about 65 million years ago in what is now the Yucatan, and it wiped out 75 or 80 percent of all the species on Earth, including all the dinosaurs, and it's thought that only three species of birds survived that impact 65 million years ago and the just catastrophic effects of the years after that impact. So all of the birds we see today are evolved from three species that survived that asteroid 65 million years ago and that they've become incredibly diverse and incredibly specialized and feathers are still one of their defining features. This is a diagram of a house sparrow just showing how all the feathers fit on the body of the bird. Every feather on a bird's body is uniquely suited to that location. So there's essentially every pair of feathers, a left and right matching feather on a bird is uh, different, unique. Um, the feathers on a bird's head are tiny, they get larger going back along the body. The feathers on the wings are incredibly specialized. Each feather shaped slightly differently for that position on the wings. Um, the evolution of uh, feathers continues uh, now, but the, it's just produced some incredible specialization uh, for flight, um, for ornamentation, um, and one of the most important functions of feathers are as insulation, which brings us back to the, the winter season. Feathers and, and down, goose down, eider down, is the most efficient insulation known on earth. Um, more insulating power per weight than any other material, man-made or natural. Um, which is why uh, you know, down jackets, down sleeping bags are still uh, the ultimate uh, insulation. Um, and birds, birds have it. Birds are covered with down. Underneath all these outer, this outer shell of feathers, which are waterproof and windproof and streamlining, um, birds have a layer of down that insulates them. This is a diagram of a ring-necked pheasant showing the body, the flesh and bones of the bird underneath all the feathers. And you can see how much of the bird, how much of what we see of the bird is feathers. The wings are almost entirely feathers. 
Um, the tail is entirely fetters. Uh, and this is partly, in this illustration, I used it in the book to talk about the adaptations of flight. It's one of the, one of the adaptations that makes flight possible that doesn't get much press is the, the fact that the, the bulk of a bird's body is incredibly compact. All the, the flesh and bones, the heavy parts of a bird's body have been consolidated into this very small compact mass that is centrally located and balanced below the wings. This is one of the things that makes flight possible for birds is that the, the body is so compact. So all of the, the muscles that control the wings are in the breast, um, in the central part of the body. The muscles that move the legs are up in the upper leg, the, again, in that compact mass of muscle that is the body. What we see in the long extensions of the bird, the wings are all feathers. The legs are just slender bones and tendons. And the muscles that control those are up inside the body. Um, the bill is small, lightweight, um, uh, no muscles, just um, small jaw muscles there. Birds swallow their food whole and it gets processed inside their body, again, in that central mass. So as soon as they swallow something, it's part of that central body mass. Um, all of these are adaptations that make flight possible, but coincidentally also adaptations that make a bird better insulated, that the, the body is kept at 104, 105 degrees. Um, and the more compact, the more, um, uh, uh, the smaller that area of heat, uh, the better it can be insulated. So the feathers wrap around this central body mass and keep it warm. And the only things extending out beyond that central body mass are the, the legs, which are just bones and tendons and need almost no warmth. The wing bones, again, it's slender bones and mostly tendons um, in the, the bony part of the wing. Um, the rest is feathers, and a slender neck, small head, the bill doesn't have to be kept warm, it's uh, mostly keratin like our fingernails, um, and uh, so the only part of the bird that really has to be kept warm is that central body, and it can be really well insulated by this complete coat of feathers. Um, birds also have a system of countercurrent circulation in their legs and in their wings so that blood that's um, coming back into the body after getting cooled off out in the feet or in the wings gets warmed up again as it, as it moves back into the body. The outgoing blood transfers its heat to the incoming blood so that um, a bird doesn't lose much heat um, by uh, um, pumping blood out through its extremities. Um, and all of this is what makes it possible for birds like these golden crowned kinglets to survive the winter in, in the north. Um, and golden crowned kinglet, I think, is one of the most remarkable species. They weigh only five or six grams, a quarter of an ounce. Um, so the uh, the joke is you could put four of them in an envelope and mail them for the price of one stamp. <laughs> um, tiny, so tiny birds, only five or six grams. Um, and still their body temperature is 105 degrees. So they've got a tiny body maintained at 105 degrees and maybe a half inch thick um, jacket of feathers of down that covers that. And they maintain that body temperature even on the coldest winter nights, 20 below. Um, and how they do that is by um, partly by, by their insulation. Um, they have a, 
high metabolism. So they're producing, their bodies are burning fuel and producing a lot of heat. Um, and so the if you scale the kinglet up to the size of a human, if we had the same metabolism as a kinglet, we would need to eat um, approximately 27 large pizzas each day to uh, maintain that body temperature. That's the amount of fuel relative to their body size that kinglets are taking in. So they have to be constantly finding food in the form of these kinglets eat mostly um, insect um, prey. So, and in the winter, they're finding um, little frozen spider eggs, frozen insects that are hiding out in the branches of spruce trees. Um, and somehow they find enough of that to fuel them, to keep them going through a whole winter in the north. Um, and at night, they'll use, they fluff up their feathers to get a thicker coat of down. So it's like putting on a couple of extra layers. They tuck their bill in so that their breath, they're, they're breathing in then warmed air that's inside their feathers. And, and as they breathe out, the warm air from, in, from their lungs is um, pumped back in underneath their feathers they go into a state of torpor where they reduce their body temperature and slow down their, their body processes at night. Um, and kinglets have a habit of um, actually sheltering in small groups. They'll find a, a little shelter and uh, five or eight or 12 kinglets will all crowd in together and um, use each other's body warmth to stay warm. They just mostly just try to find a really sheltered spot, fluff up their feathers, reduce their uh, metabolism a little bit, reduce their body temperature, and uh, make it through the night. Um, and wake up the next morning and go out and try to find enough food to get through another day. Uh, when temperatures are extremely cold, they'll actually stay torpid longer and reduce their activity. So. Um, on the coldest days of the winter, you might notice that birds come to the bird feeder later in the morning. They're less active. They're still coming out to look for food, but they're, uh, they're reducing their activity, staying in this super insulated, torpid state longer uh, and uh, waiting for warmer weather to get more active. Um, now, chickadees, just like um, blue jays spend a lot of time gathering and hiding food. Um, so they'll stash tens of thousands of seeds in, in hiding places through the fall and then go back in the winter. And the studies have shown that they can remember uh, most of those hiding places. And, and they remember not just the location, but the, the, how perishable the food was and what quality it was. So they'll go back to places where they stashed something perishable. They'll go back there sooner to retrieve that or really high quality food, like say a sunflower seed, they'll go back um, to that when they really need something or uh, probably go back to that sooner <laughs> rather than leaving it to chance, to, hoping that it's there later. But um, birds like chickadees and blue jays are just, uh, they spend the whole fall planning for the winter, stashing food and uh, memorizing, remembering all of these locations. Um, and one of the things that really impressed me as I was working on this book, what it's like to be a bird is how much, how many decisions birds are making um, and how much of their life is, um, is guided by instinct, but instinct is more like a, a, um, a sort of a, a, a feelings that might push them in or guide them in different directions, but they still have to make decisions all the time. And this tufted titmouse, I use this illustration in the book to talk about um, 
when a titmouse flies up to the bird feeder, it's faced with a, a lot of different choices there, big seeds, small seeds. Um, and you'll see birds like um, tufted titmouse and chickadees, um, the ones that fly off into the woods with a seed, they'll spend some time at the bird feeder deciding which seed to take. They'll test different ones, pick up seeds and drop them, and finally find one that they like and fly off into the woods with that. They're apparently, um, one of the things they're doing is, is weighing, getting a sense of the weight of the seed and a, a heavier seed a heavier piece of food is likely to have more fat. Fat is denser. Um, so they'll test several seeds and, and pick one that they like and then fly off into the woods with that. Um, other species like the finches, goldfinches and house finches, um, they tend to just sit on the feeder and eat. And they're less particular <laughs> because they're just, they're just grabbing what's right in front of them and eating it while they sit at the feeder. Um, for birds like chickadees and titmice, the decision of which piece of food to take away with them is more important. So they'll actually spend a few seconds testing different seeds and deciding which one to take. Um, and uh, the other, um, Another decision that birds are making, there's some research that shows that um, birds around a bird feeder, um, uh, when, there's, uh, when a predator is nearby, and the researchers in this case played recordings of predator sounds, like a cooper's hawk call, a hawk that would uh, catch and eat birds at a bird feeder. They played recordings of the hawk and birds stayed away from the bird feeder until the very end of the day. Um, and the birds like song sparrows, the other songbirds that would normally be visiting the feeder throughout the day, delayed their feeding, um, partly obviously to avoid the hawk, but also the researchers concluded that it was um, in order to um, avoid gaining weight because birds, they need to eat a lot of food each day. They lose 10% of their body weight each night um, through burning fat and evaporating water and defecating. And so they have to gain 10% of their body weight back each day. And that requires a lot of eating. And as they get heavier, they're less agile, they're less quick in flight and less able to evade a predator if they're being chased by a hawk. So um, the, the conclusion of that research was that the birds were um, delaying feeding to delay weight gain so that they could stay agile and quick through the day. And then as the hawks were getting less active at the end of the day, the birds would come out just before sunset and gulp down a bunch of food and disappear into their nighttime roosting place to spend the night and digest. And um, uh, oh, I should, I'll end with just, just answering what I, I suspect will be one of the questions that, that comes up is, um, is bird feeding good or bad? Um, I've talked a lot about bird feeders here and I think, I mean, uh, there's been now several different studies have shown that that bird feeding uh, doesn't have any real detrimental effects on birds. Um, as long as your bird feeder is um, uh, in a location where the birds aren't exposed to um, to cats, outdoor cats, or too close to a window where the birds would crash into a window and, and be injured or killed. Um, and as long as there's cover nearby where the birds can escape if a predator like a hawk shows up, um, the birds will, they'll avoid a feeder that's too open or too dangerous. Um, and several studies have shown that um, bird feeding does not make birds dependent. It does not keep birds from migrating. Um, 
they only use the feeder as a supplement to their natural food. And as when the weather's warmer, right now, this time of year, a lot of people are probably noticing that there are fewer birds at their feeders. Um, that is because the weather's still nice and warm. There's still insects active in a lot of places. The birds can find lots of natural food out in the thickets and, and fields and, and the woods. Um, they don't need the bird feeder. They'll come to the bird feeder on a snowy day when it gets very cold. Uh, later in the winter, when the natural food starts to be depleted, um, that's when the bird feeders become much more active. But even then, the birds are only using it to supplement what they're getting in the wild. And if, if the bird feeder disappears, if you go away on vacation and stop feeding for a couple of weeks, um, those birds will be just fine. They'll find, they'll switch to finding natural food. Um, so I hope that uh, I've given you some, some insight into um, what's going on in the, the birds that will be visiting your bird feeder and uh, uh, just touched on a few of the amazing things that birds are capable of and, and what they're doing. And um, looking forward to uh, answering some of your questions. Hello, David. Uh, this is Stan Hines from the North Shire Bookstore. And uh, yeah. thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for your book. Your, um, over the last year and a half, it, uh, your, your book, uh, What It's Like to Be a Bird, is by far a best-selling bird book. And it's great to have another, another Christmas with it. And uh, I know it'll be evergreen for us. And so it's just a, a, a wonderful book to be able to offer to our customers. Thanks very much. Thank you. So I, I do have a, a, a few questions for you and then um, they're pretty, they're really all over the place. I hope the people who are with us tonight will be as uh, interested in, uh, in these topics as uh, they are to me. And the first one um, is, uh, I wanna ask you about birds that show up in places where they don't belong. There was uh, in New York Times recently, there was an article about a Stellar's sea eagle that showed up in Eastern Canada and, I guess they live in Asia and perhaps Alaska. And then right here in Southern Vermont, uh, Davith alluded to this uh, uh, in his introduction, a brown booby um, showed up at a place called Emerald Lake. And I believe their, their home is in the Caribbean and maybe as far north as Florida. And so I just wondered if you would talk a little bit about birds showing up where they don't belong. Yeah, it's and it's one of the things that makes bird watching so exciting is that you never know what's going to show up, um, and sometimes really really remarkable things like the stellar sea eagle, which was in the Gaspé Peninsula earlier this summer, um, and uh, that's a bird that's native to Siberia. Kamchatka Peninsula is the the center of their range. So it's way off course, but that happens. Um, and sometimes, well, these, I like to think of those birds as, as the pioneers. Um, they're, they're exploring, they're expanding their territory, uh, exploring new possibilities. Um, and there's lots and lots of examples of, of um, you know, very rare occurrences, a, a new species showing up somewhere, and then a few years later, another one, and a few years after that, another. And um, you know, lesser black-backed gull is one species that um, many people listening tonight will probably be familiar with. 50 years ago, it was incredibly rare, almost unknown in North America. There were only a handful of records. Um, and when one showed up, it was really big news. They're native to Europe and um, Britain and Europe. So a, a few started showing up 50 years ago. And uh, now it's, they're nesting in Greenland. There's a suspicion that they might be nesting in Northern Canada somewhere, but hundreds and hundreds of them migrate down the Atlantic coast of the US every fall. Um, and winter in Florida, um, the southeastern U.S. into the Caribbean. So it's there's an example of one where uh, it was the first few that showed up were a 
just way off course, extremely rare occurrence. And over a period of just a few decades, um, they've established a whole new migration pattern. There's a hundred thousands of lesser black back gulls now that migrate from Greenland to winter in um, the southeastern US and then back to Greenland. Well, um, speaking of migration, then my, my next uh, question comment uh, has to do with a video that I recently saw on the Cornell site about wimbrels. wimbrels. Um, uh, there's a tiny little uh, island uh, right off of Edisto Island and Seabrook Island in South Carolina called DeVoe Bank, um, where scientists knew that a lot of wimbrels came through there uh, every year, but they didn't realize how many until they started spending the night there. And their estimate was perhaps 20,000 wimbrels at one time on DeVoe Bank, which they estimate might be half the total population of wimbrels in the world. And so I, I just thought that was fascinating and I wondered what you thought of that. Yeah, that was, it's an incredible discovery. And, um, uh, you know, the, I guess one of the, one of the questions is how long that's been going on that birds, what we're learning in the last few decades is that migration patterns can change dramatically in a short time. Um, these are habits of the birds, sort of habitual things that they do, and they adapt very quickly to changes in food and weather, uh, climate. Um, so um, it's possible that this is a fairly new phenomenon that the wimbrel are gathering there um, on their migration, um, but we'll never know, I guess it was just just discovered, um, but it uh, whether it, um, whether it's been going on for ten years or or a hundred um, doesn't really matter. It's um it's just an incredible discovery, and it it, it also highlights uh, another thing that makes bird watching so exciting is the potential for that kind of discovery. And something that I highlighted, I tried to highlight throughout the book what it's like to be a bird is what we don't know about birds. And it's really surprising what isn't known about even really familiar birds like chimney swift and American woodcock and American robin. There are unanswered questions about all these birds that um, you know a careful observer in, in their own backyard could add significantly to uh, what's known about birds just by watching. Um, so at, uh... Here's a thing that I don't know about birds, um, and this is, on, this is kind of a personal uh, thing with me. You devote a few pages to crows and ravens in your book, um, famously intelligent birds. Uh, and just this fall, I don't know if I hadn't noticed it before or if, or if it's just something that I started noticing, but um, I see crows on my drive to work. I drive about seven miles to work every morning. And as I drive along, I'll see one crow, two crows, five crows, and they're just hanging out in the road and they, and they fly off as I drive by. And, but I don't see roadkill necessarily, but these crows are just gathered there, sometimes in the middle of the road or the side of the road. Do you have any idea what these crows are doing? I suspect that they're looking for roadkill, okay. um, that it's probably food related and okay. you see you see it mostly early in the morning on your your yes. morning commute yeah and it's um you know in in the southwest in like texas there's a, a bird called crested caracara it's actually a falcon in the falcon family but a kind of specialized hawk like falcon um and they have a habit of patrolling the roads early in the morning so you'll see them just flying <laughs> straight along the road, just 30, 50 feet up in the air, just flying along, following the road, looking to see what, what the cars have left behind during the night. Um, and I suspect that even though you're not seeing roadkill, there might be mice or frogs or, um, or just, you know, other, other sure. uh, <laughs> bits <laughs> left, left behind. 
Um, so uh, that's my guess is that it would be food related and, and things happen during the night. Right. Um, so we were chatting a little bit before the event started and I mentioned that um, I've just been birding for about three years now. And um, this past summer, um, the people that um, I, I go out with uh, were commenting that it seemed in May and June in particular, when we were expecting to see lots of warblers and, and, and migrating birds, that it seemed like it was a bad, bad season for birding. Uh, that weren't seeing seeing the species or the numbers. And um, I, I, you know, was that your experience? And do you have any thoughts about that? Um, you know, it's um, seeing seeing migration as a birder is so hit or miss. Um, it's um, I think in here in Massachusetts where I am, it was um, uh, the warbler migration was uh, a little delayed, but was was fairly good this spring. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it just, it, what we actually see is such a tiny fraction of the birds that are actually migrating. Um, it depends on the weather and, and the we weather, weather patterns on weekends when most people actually right. go out birding. Right. Um, that forms the birder's impression of what, what the migration was like. And there's, when there's plenty of evidence that bird populations of many species are declining. Um, so there is, uh, um, there's some, there's some evidence to back up the impression that the bird migration isn't what it was, um, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but what you see in any given spring is, um, depends a lot more on the local weather conditions and exactly which days you you get out birding and and what places right. you go right. and it can vary you know one a birder uh 50 miles away can have a completely different experience um just because of that right um i'll i'll ask you one more before we and then we'll open it up to um to the questions. And this one, again, I apologize, uh, but it's also kind of on a personal note, but you know, I mean, there are a lot of birds that, that I would love to see uh, before I die, but and, um, there are a couple of birds that I haven't seen that are not rare. And, and one lives here, I'm pretty sure, and one does not. And the one that I haven't seen that uh, is native is the snowy owl. How, how do I increase my chances of seeing a snowy owl? And the one that I'm pretty sure it doesn't live in Vermont is the red-headed woodpecker. You know, it's this like, iconic image of a of a red-headed woodpecker, but I but I don't think I've ever seen one. So how can I yeah. uh, see one or both of these birds? Yeah, both both pretty rare in Vermont. Um, snowy owl comes in the winter, um, uh, but they're they're sort of cyclical. They, when they have a really good nesting season in the Arctic, then large numbers move south. Um, this winter so far seems to be not a particularly big winter for them, um, coming south into New England. Um, but the best, the the most consistent places to see them are um, uh, on the coast, the coast of Massachusetts. Um, Plum Island, Logan Airport is a good, okay. uh, you, you can't actually get there to see them, but it is a very reliable place where they show up in the winter. Um, big open areas. Um, your best bet of seeing one in Vermont, I think is just to keep, to monitor the, the bird news. And when you right. hear of one being seen in a farm field somewhere, try to get there and, and see it. Um, there's some islands in the Western, the, the eastern end of Lake Ontario uh, on the Ontario side, um, Amherst Island mm. is a well-known place for owls. It's a, a big open farmland area and really consistently um, attracts snowy owls in the winter. So if you don't, if the border opens up and you don't mind a, a drive into uh, Ontario, that's not too far from Vermont and uh, you have a good chance of seeing snowy owl there. Yeah. 
Exactly. And red-headed woodpecker is a, a really a southern, midwestern, right. southern species. So we're New England, even New York State is outside of kind of the core of their range. So it's always a rare bird. Okay. Um, and uh, again, um, monitoring the news, the bird news, and and going to look for one that's been found somewhere is going to be your best bet of seeing yeah. one. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for your time, David. Uh, it's been sure. a real a real pleasure. And um, we'll open it up. I will throw it back to to Rachel and David. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you so much, Stan. This has been an absolute delight. Um, the first question we've got, it's from Pilar. She says, I'm nine years old, and I would like to be a bird scientist when I grow up. David, do you have any tips for her? Ah, well, that's exactly what I wanted to do <laughs> when I was nine years old. So I think that's fantastic. Um, and I think the best, um, uh, the best thing to do is just watch a lot of birds and ask questions or think think about questions about what they're doing um, and look for patterns. There's, uh, you know, you'll, as you watch birds, you'll figure out, you'll kind of get a sense of what they're doing and why and figure things out. And you can read about um, uh, some of those questions um, and, uh, learn more and get more, more insight into what's going on. But um, for me, I think, um, you know, a, a big part of what I've done in my, my life and my career is just watching birds, just going outside and watching. And even though a lot of the time it seems like I'm just kind of <laughs> you know, sitting, sitting and idly watching birds, I'm still learning things all the time. I notice things, uh, notice something that a bird is doing and follow that bird and wonder about it. And, and uh, that leads to more questions and, and more, um, uh, more discoveries. Um, and uh, even now, after a lifetime of watching birds, I still, I still notice new things and learn new things all the time. Um, so I think that um, at every opportunity, just uh, getting outside and, or even inside, if you've got a bird feeder or some other way to watch birds from, from inside your house, just watching the birds at the bird feeder and really wondering about what they're doing and, and paying attention to how different birds act. Um, that's, uh, that's gonna lead to some real discoveries. Thank you. Um, I'm going to combine two questions that we got um, because they're related. Uh, Ron asked if you have any comments about hummingbirds. And Lori asked, I have hummingbirds at my feeder every summer. Is there any way I can observe their behavior and learn where their tiny nest is? Ah. <laughs> um, yes, comments. Uh, I mean, hummingbirds are really incredible. And one of the things I think about when I watch hummingbirds is what, what would the first European naturalists or any explorers, imagine coming from Europe in the 1600s and landing here in North America or Central America and seeing a hummingbird, it must have been just mind blowing. Um, uh, so yeah, hummingbirds are, and I've got a, a, cup, a few, a few pages about hummingbirds in, in the book, what it's like to be a bird and some of the just incredible things that they do. They're so extreme. Um, 70, more than 70 wing beats per second as they fly. And um, they, uh, well, anyway, there, there's many, <laughs> just uh, incredible things <clears throat> about hummingbirds. Um, finding a nest is, is difficult. They're, um, uh, like all birds, they they prefer that you don't find their nest, so <laughs> they keep it hidden, and they're pretty secretive about approaching the nest. Um, when and they they have a very wide nesting season, um, so um, if uh, if you have a lot of hummingbirds visiting your feeders, it's going to be difficult to 
um, uh, pick out one individual, but if you can find one individual female hummingbird and watch that, because hummingbirds, only the females tend to the nest. The males don't even know where the nest is. Um, they fertilize the eggs, but that's the end of their involvement. So it's only the female that's going to be flying back and forth with food. If you can recognize one individual female that's coming to your, your feeders um, and watch that female, if she's leaving the feeder area going in the same direction all the time, um, you can try to follow that line and that might lead you to a nest, but the nest could be quite far away. So um, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a challenge. There, ruby-throated hummingbirds tend to build a nest on a horizontal branch over, uh, over an opening like a stream or even a road or a driveway. So that's the, the, the spot that you will eventually be looking for is the little tiny cup nest uh, about as big as a golf ball just kind of perched on a horizontal branch over some open corridor. Um, but yes, finding those nests is really going to be a challenge. Thank you. Emily's got a question. She wants to know what are the major predators of birds in the wintertime? Uh, the, yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, I think it would be primarily hawks and the, especially the, the two species of hawks that are found in this area that hunt birds uh, are Cooper's hawk and sharp shinned hawk, the exhibitors. Um, very similar looking. Um, Cooper's hawk is a little bit bigger, but it's very difficult to distinguish the two species. But both of them um, specialize in catching small birds and they will hunt bird feeders. Um, so um, that's probably the, well, that and, and um, outdoor cats would be the two primary predators of birds in the winter. And um, I think the same, probably the same year round in this area that the, um, uh, a lot of other um, birds and animals will eat eggs or nestling birds if they find a nest, but the predators that are eat, that would take a full-grown flying bird are pretty limited, um, and it's particularly those two species of hawks and um, house cats. So this next question comes from Cecilia, and she asks, do blue jays remember individual people like crows do? Ah, um, they probably do. Yeah, it's, I, it hasn't been tested, <clears throat> but um, a couple of years ago, I ran across some YouTube videos by a woman in Canada who has been feeding and, and following a group of blue jays, and I can't remember her her name or the name of her YouTube channel, but it was really fascinating. I'm sure you could find it pretty easily. And, and the Blue Jays, clearly they recognize her. She walks out into the woods and the Blue Jays come to her and, and ask for food. Um, and I think, um, you know, there was, there's been a study that showed that mockingbirds recognize individual people and that people that have disturbed the mockingbird's nest that have like a researcher that has actually gone up and, and peeked into a mockingbird's nest will be singled out for more aggressive um, deterrence after that, where the mockingbirds will ignore or uh, be less aggressive to other people who haven't actually um, poked at the nest. Um, so I suspect that a lot of birds um, probably maybe most birds are capable of recognizing individual people. Um, crows certainly uh, uh, have, there's been a lot of research on crows and they have an incredible ability to not just recognize individual people, but to pass that information along to other crows. Um, uh, but with, with mockingbirds being shown to recognize people and, and lots of other evidence like this blue jay, 
um, uh, blue jay group that recognizes the the person who feeds them. Um, I suspect that blue jays will uh, can recognize individual people. Thank you. John wants to know, do you see changes in bird behaviors happening as the number of species declines? Uh, well, that's, um, I would say the, the number of species in this area isn't declining. Um, and it's a tricky, you know, when we talk about bird declines, there's big headlines a few years ago or two years ago, I guess, about um, the number of birds, the overall decline of bird population over the last 50 years. Um, and when you look at the, the species, would you take it species by species, a lot of, a lot of species have increased in that time over the last few decades. So there's a lot of species in Massachusetts and New England um, in this region that have increased tremendously and, and everyone <laughs> um, watching, uh, listening tonight will know uh, like Canada geese, wild turkey, um, uh, red-tailed hawk. These are species that are doing really well in the suburban habitats around people and um, have increased a lot. So, um, and uh, surveys like the Christmas bird count, which is coming up in a few weeks, um, the places, you know, when I, in the 1970s, when I was a kid, I was participating in the New Haven, Connecticut Christmas bird count where I lived. And uh, we would find 120 to 130 species in that, count circle um, each year, it was pretty consistent. And I think it's still right around that number. The number of species hasn't changed. Um, it's slightly different species. And many of those species that maybe they were common and now they're rare or vice versa, but um, the total number of species has not changed very much. Um, now, I guess getting to the, the question, um, uh, you know, bird behavior changes, it's changing all the time. Birds are taking advantage of new opportunities. So birds like red-tailed hawk that were 50 years ago, it was a bird of kind of open farmland, far from people. Um, uh, now it's a suburban bird and same with Cooper's hawk. Um, they've moved into the suburbs and, and are thriving in the wooded suburbs all over Eastern North America. Um, so there are some changes in behavior or changes in, in sort of habitat use, um, but it probably has more to do with just that species finding a niche that it can exploit and um, uh, less persecution, less um, uh, less danger, um, and not not about interaction between different species of birds, but just about one species finding a finding a niche that it can take advantage of. So this next one comes from Jenny, um, and I love it. Uh, she'd love you to comment on the one or two discoveries that you've had that have excited you the most. Oh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> hmm. that is a good question. Um, you know, I um, uh, it's hard to. I'm trying to think back of all uh, other. You know, it's always, it's very exciting to just stumble onto a really rare bird. And I've had many, many experiences of that, just being birding somewhere. And, and it's, um, it's, you know, the way our brains work and pattern recognition, you're out birding, you're looking at, you're looking at birds and something completely unexpected comes along. It doesn't compute <laughs> right away. So it's sort of a, this, this, this uh, 
kind of brain brain gymnastics that go on as you you sort of reorient and figure out what's going on and why that bird doesn't look quite right and and then it clicks and it's uh, so that's um, that's exciting but I'm you know I'm thinking back of the was it maybe 10 or 15 years ago um, watching my bird feeder in in the Boston suburbs in Massachusetts um, on a snowy day and I was watching the juncos and um, um, I wrote about this on my on my blog back then but I was watching the juncos and trying to sort out the variation in the colors and patterns of the different juncos watching one individual bird that kind of stood out and realized that it was behaving a little differently and um, and that led to the discovery that I could tell a difference between male and female juncos by their their shape, their posture, their behavior at the bird feeder. The females are a little smaller, slimmer, um, and more um, deferential, sort of. Uh, they kind of hop around the edges, um, and the males are a little bigger, a little kind of thick-necked, and um, more aggressive. So they would stake out the location right in the middle of the bird feeding area on the ground and just sit there and and they were frequently chasing off other juncos. So that was a real um, sort of uh, epiphany moment of realizing that that it wasn't just a bunch of juncos on the ground under the bird feeder. It was males and females interacting in different ways and and behaving in slightly different ways. Um, and that's the kind of discovery that I get really excited about because it suddenly, it, it explains a lot of what's going on. It, it opens up a whole new uh, world, a whole new way of looking at the flock of juncos that's at the bird feeder. Um, well, this has been such a delight. I'm afraid we're almost out of time, but uh, there's one last question I can get to and that's, um, from Ezra, he says, I heard about the roseate spoonbills and wood storks coming north this year. What's the main driving cause for their north, northward movement? Yeah, that's, that, that is, it's been a, a pattern over the last few years that roseate spoonbill, which was a, uh, it's a southeastern species found on the Gulf Coast and in Florida, and pretty rare anywhere north of Florida, even the coast of Georgia doesn't get very many roseate spoonbills. Um, and the last couple of years in the late summer, they've been showing up throughout the Midwest all the way up into, um, into New England. Um, there were several this summer um, in, uh, I think in Vermont, Massachusetts, Maine. Um, so I think it's all young birds and, and maybe one thing it might indicate is a very good nesting season with a lot of young birds produced, but it it probably has to do with um, uh, changing climate, warming warming climate, so that there um, uh, you know, there's a there's a well known pattern of wading birds like herons, egrets, and spoonbills and wood storks. Um, they um, uh, their food is is small fish and other small aquatic animals that um, they, their best strategy for feeding is as, um, as ponds dry up, um, the food gets concentrated in the shrinking pool of water. So they can feed very efficiently <laughs> when the food is concentrated like that. And um, uh, so when the either either ponds just dry up completely or a big dump of rain happens and there's too much water and the food is more dispersed in that, that abundance of water, then the birds disperse um, looking for um, more food. And they can find by late summer, the ponds farther north in the more Northern states are getting into that similar kind of condition where there's been several months of really good production of fish and frogs and invertebrates. So there's a lot of food and the ponds are starting to dry up so that these 
wading birds, I think maybe just just keep exploring farther north and finding food. And for whatever reason, that's been happening a lot in the last few years, just with roseate spoonbills, wood storks. Um, but it's known in a lot of species like even great egret, snowy egret, little blue heron, all these species disperse north in the late summer. Um, so yeah, that's a really interesting phenomenon and, and pattern over the last couple of years. And it'll be interesting to see if that continues, if maybe we have uh, you know, 20 years from now, maybe roseate spoonbills are nesting in New York state or Massachusetts. <laughs> but it's always changing. Bird, the bird life is just constantly changing and surprising us. Thank you so much, David. This has been just a fascinating evening. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us tonight. And I appreciate Stan, your wonderful questions and audience, your wonderful questions and your presence here with us. Um, if you haven't done so already, you can order the book at northshire.com and you can also check out, out our great list of other upcoming events there. Thank you all so very, very much and have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a great evening. <laughs>